So we have a really interesting talk for you. We're going to find out why you aren't able to buy PS5 or, PS5 or a graphics card or any other in-demand item. We have a first-time speaker and first-time at DEF CON uh, member up here, Eric Katar. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. So every time you buy anything online, especially if it's a limited stock item, you compete against both and most likely to lose miserably. You probably can relate with the statement if you'd ever try to get your hands on a Xbox or PS5 console and couldn't quite understand why the stock is always out even three minutes after restock. Maybe when you scroll down on your social feed, you've seen your favorite unsearched uh, console tickets sold by four or five times of their original price and wondered how come. Maybe even on your way here to DEF CON when you try to book yourself a flying ticket, you, watch, you watched how the prices goes up even for flights that were just published. Both uh, operators are to blame. Every bot can simulate thousands of human-like web interactions. They will buy anything you want before you even Google it. They will schedule appointments with government services that you will pay for later. They will win at every online auction that you will attend and they will fake positive reviews that will lolly buy your bullshit detectors into buying scam products. Even when you're asleep, there's a really good chance that the bot is trying to log his way into one of your 200 plus accounts while to enumerate your password. Bots are responsible for 77% of the global hacking and fraud activities. That comes up to almost a quarter of the total internet traffic. Regardless if we like it or not, malicious automation is here to stay. It serves tens of thousands of underground hackers and drive millions of dollars worth of economies. Uh, in the next 40 minutes, I will give you a deep dive into the fascinating architecture and techniques that are being used by threat uh, actors, by both operators when they're trying to uh, crack their way into your password or log in and steal uh, away your uh, stock from your cart. So a little bit about myself. My dad served uh, two decades uh, in the Israeli uh, police force as the head of uh, inv uh, fraud investigation department. Uh, during this time, he got a chance to investigate the most uh, fascinating uh, criminals that hacked the financial system during what is considered now then uh, the era of financial fraud. Among all of those people were also the ex-husband of my mother, which 20 years later led me to the most awkward how I met your mother conversation that you can ever imagine. And of course, growing up with a detective dad wasn't always an easy task. Here you can see a really authentic photo of me and my dad having the where have you been last night casual conversation on Saturday. Uh, but on the good part, uh, I got a chance to hear a lot of stories, fascinating stories about criminals. And those uh, uh, financial fraudsters, their courage and their creativity and their ability to flex their mind and to hack into systems. That was the characteristics that I found in myself and this was what shaped my point of view as a cybersecurity researcher that researched from the hacker perspective uh, not from the defender perspective. And indeed in the last uh, five years I spent most of my time under 64 different hacking avatar, different identities on uh, darknet, deep web and open web uh, sources collecting intelligence for the companies I work for. Uh, I started my way in Byte Data. Some of you will know it as Luminati Networks. Some of you, the older ones, will know it as Hola VPN. In uh, Byte Data, I was in charge of doing an uh, investigation uh, upon high-profile clients that try to misuse residential proxy IPs for a uh, cyber act uh, activity, for cyber attacks, DDoS, frauds, and all this kind of stuff. I had to carry a lot of investigation there, but the most interesting one was a three months of investigation after a 21 year old from Latvia that basically uh, simulated 30,000 very popular platform, gaming platform users uh, using 30,000 concurrent sessions at, at every time. 
he was collecting through the bot users uh, uh, the coins, the gaming coins, centralized them in specific avatar, went to the gaming shop, bought some skins, uh, swords, and sold every sword for $6,000. This uh, kid made in three weeks $1.6 million. Uh, just from selling uh, sword skins of a popular gaming platform. In 2020, I moved to the uh, Defender side to Parameter X, which two weeks ago mex uh, merged with Human Security. Uh, there, I basically mapped the landscape, the threat landscape of any threat actor that is trying to uh, hurt our clients and basically did a lot of proactive threat intelligence activity like credential honeypots that were reposted by other uh, crackers that didn't know it's a honeypot, or hunting down malwares and info stealers that ran in the wild at least a year and a half before discovered by antiviruses. Uh, so a, a lot of this experience I'm going to uh, take the most uh, meaningful insights there and share it to you. Our agenda for today, first I'm going to define what is exactly top performing, because it's really arbitrary a title there. Afterwards, we're going to, in the first part of the talk, talk about uh, account crackers specifically, those who are trying to uh, steal your account. If you ever lost an account to an hacker, you'll find it uh, very interesting. The second part will be dedicated to retail scalping, which means using bots to hack the stock of specific uh, retail product. To buy, it, to buy all the stock and to sell it to you after a, in three times of its original price. Uh, lately, lastly, we'll have a, a summary of all the TTPs we went through and we'll talk about the future of motion of some automations. And after the talk will be over, I'm gonna have, of course, a Q&A personal session here. So I promise not to answer like a bot. So, like I said, we're going to focus on two use cases since the whole malicious automation world is enormous. Uh, first is going to be account takeover using credential brute force, and the second one is retail scalping, using automation to buy stock, retail stock. Uh, I'm de I've defined top performing as those hackers who maintain a sustainable business model, meaning we are not aiming into hit and runners here. We're talking about those who are making a living out of their operation. There should be at least six months of online presence to these hackers, and they should be belong to the top 20%. And I'm going to clarify this one because the hacking distribution, the hacking skill distribution among application hackers uh, pretty much apply to the 2080 law, which means that while 80% uh, of the hackers out there are making only 20% of the successful logins, the rest of 20% are making actually 80% of the successful logins or checkouts. So I'm going to focus on that specifically uh, 20% which means I'm not going to specifically talk about the most common tools or techniques, but those who are rare but serve the top performers here. So let's jump in. First we'll do the brute force. So there are many brute force tools out there. They are all uh, purpose is practically the same. It's to camouflage all the concurrent sessions into real login. And they all do it by uh, performed as a one-stop shop for the cracker architecture, which means that all the components of the architecture that I'm going to talk about in the next slides come all together in this dashboard that you can see of Open Bullet. Um, while there are many uh, uh, tools out there, uh, one of them, their, his popul uh, popularity has went exponentially high in the last few years. His name is Open Bullet. It's an open source uh, uh, tool that, like other many uh, cracking tools developed from web testing that went uh, into uh, Open Bullet and from there to Black Bullet and Cyber Bullet. Now all of the three works under the same principles, but they have different uh, integration uh, capabilities with other hacking tools. And practically this will be the open that will uh, uh, cook the whole, uh, uh, that will bake this whole cake that the hacker is doing. Now that I have the open, I need a, a recipe of the attack, and that will be the config itself. It will be the script that runs all everything. Um, every config can be roughly divided into three main parts. The first part that you can see on the right uh, upper high, right 
is the, the part that de, uh, defines the path of the attack itself. It will include all the headers and the static variables that will repeat with every user that will use this attack specifically. Uh, the second one will be the authentication, the login itself to the account. This is where you can find the payload manipulation techniques, the re cookie replay attack uh, methods, legit services spoofing or API spoofing in which a hacker finds out an API that's supposed to communicate with a legit third party and he rides on it to make a, a logins because this path is not regulated by the target site. Uh, the last path of every, the part of every uh, attack config will be the capture. And this is what you can see right there in the middle. Uh, after the login is made, the first, uh, as part of the same attack, it will go to your account and it will try to figure out what essence do you have. Here you can see a checklist of uh, very popular streaming services. So we check what kind of uh, programs the uh, hacked uh, account has it on his, uh, of course, uh, subscription. And this is how the hacker knows later how to price this stolen account. Because stolen accounts that has credit card worth much more than the one that don't. Uh, and, and the left and the right uh, and the bottom, you can see uh, an ad of uh, a config developer that published it in an underground form. You can see he, stands, he talks about CPM. CPM stands for credentials per minute or combo per minute which means this is the highest amount of credential that you can uh, uh, try per uh, a specific path, specific config. Uh, and it tells you it depends on your proxy services and your recapture services. So it depends, like the number you can attempt depends on other architecture components that we'll talk about in the next slide. Also, it's mentioning that it has a capture of credit card and gift card. This is a CC and CG you see at the bottom. It means that uh, this uh, specific uh, script can tell you exactly what uh, is the, the essence inside the, the, inside the, the account, what you as a hacker need to go and figure it out and log in yourself. Of course, he's limiting to it five copies and he's doing differential pricing in order for that not to be spread too much and not being patched by security companies. So now we have the uh, tool, we have the receipt, but we don't have any cake. And the cake starts with the credentials themselves. It's commonly to believe in the cybersecurity community that credentials are easy to get, but uh, need to go through some steps in order to get them, like paying a little bit or going to the dark net. While the truth, the awful truth is they are really out there. The screenshot that you are seeing right now is from a marketplace that you can find on Google, and you, everyone can sign up and have access to all of these credentials. This is almost 11 billion credentials. If you ever found your email, old email address in Have I Been Pwned, it's practically going to be here. This is a compilation of all the data breach from the last 10 years. 11 billion uh, credentials for the use of many hackers that are keep re uh, recycling those credentials again and again and again. So hacker knows that, of course. Uh, they are, this is their playground. And they keep collecting those combos all the time running them from VPS, virtual servers that has much more stack capability, when, and, and of, of course establishing MySQL server in which they can use for creating rich data sets that will later be used for cracking your password. And I will touch it later. Uh, of course, this uh, database can be shared among several hacker, uh, specific hacking groups, or it can be privately used, but the biggest essence here is that most of the people in this crowd also are reusing the same password across different services. And hackers know that. So they're creating the tables that create your email, your password, and all of the last passwords. So it can be used later on when they try to brute force. So it's really nice that I have a lot of credentials, and 11 billion is really nice, but I can't do attack with 11 billion credentials because I will go bankrupt as a hacker. So the next step, it's not necessarily in which it's a step in which they will go and do mail validation. Mail validation, practically, it's a process in which they go and clean non-relevant users that are not signed up to the target site because there's no logic targeting uh, accounts that don't really exist. And they will do it mainly with using two techniques. The first one will try to figure out using the website itself. 
it will be an open bullet config that will be marked as VM, valid mail config. And you can find many of those online for free. And they will go to the target site and they will do forgot password with the victim email and they will check the response. If the response will be this uh, uh, email does not match to our records, then I should not uh, uh, attack it as a hacker. So I will put it on the ban list and I will filter out more my uh, uh, target uh, uh, lists. But if I get, hey, we sent you a recent link to this uh, email, this is, that means that this uh, practical, this uh, uh, user is signed up and this is why it will be later on uh, targeted as a brute force attack. The other path that can go uh, is uh, more stealth and it will use and exploit unregulated API path that will practically, they will uh, check using this IP API path if the uh, email is signed up or not, depend on the request that they will get. If it's 400 or three, then, but if it's something else, uh, leave it in the site itself. And now we have everything that we need to do, but we don't want to guess all the possible combination. We want to be precise as hackers, and we want to aim directly to the point, like a sniper, not just shooting like Arnold Schwarzenegger is one of the movies. And this is uh, the precondition before doing the enumeration itself. There are two predictabilities that make our password really predictable into hackers' eyes. First, the, 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 type, the first type will be involved with the pattern itself. Every target site has a, a password policy, like you can see right here. But most of the people, when they sign up to account, they don't, the last thing that they want to, go, to do is to think creative about new password that they will have to remember. Most of the people will just go by the simplest uh, uh, roles out there, which means that the, our hacker doesn't need to try all the combination. It can jo just go for the most common one. Like, let's just say I'm supposed to do eight to 100 characters. Most of the people will use eight to 10. So therefore, I have no reason to enumerate more than that. Uppercase and lowercase will usually be uh, uppercase prefix, which is a, a built-in feature in every brute force uh, uh, a tool out there. And also the list, uh, num when you need to use a, a number, most of the people will use one, five or seven suffix in the password. Also there are uh, the creative people that use the keystrokes that are uh, next to each other and creating uh, different shapes and this is what helps them remember that. But just so you know, it's a feature that exists in a lot of uh, uh, tools out there. So when they are doing the enumeration, they will first try the keys that are next to each other. The next uh, part that we have of predictability is around, involved around the content itself. This stats comes from the last uh, year uh, Google's research about passwords. And it involves 50%, uh, it practically says that 50% of US adults are reusing at least, uh, are using the same one password uh, in at least 12 different services. 33% will use their pet's name. And this is where it all comes to a big one uh, uh, workflow. First, the hacker will use, uh, will go back to the table that I've talked about in the last slides, uh, where they have the username and they have the password and they will enrich uh, those uh, database, data sets with uh, the victim's PII. It's really easy to do that using open source uh, repositories out there that are just for looking up uh, accounts that are related to the specific email, social media accounts, and extract from specific the places these data points like uh, education institutions, spouse names, birthdays, everything are totally available out there. As, any, as you can see, they're using a password generator that has these capabilities. Like you can see there, use password or birth date or postcode, all of those will be used for doing smart enumeration, not just one that goes off rand randomly. And the enumeration at the end will be uh, depend on three things. The victim PII, like its pet's name, its wife's name, uh, 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 birthday and stuff like that. Breach passwords, all the passwords they could ever found in the, in the past that being breached and outside uh, in the underground forms and the uh, password policy predictabilities that we talked about. And this is how they can turn one email into a large combination of passwords that has really good chance of hitting the target. Now that I have everything, if I try uh, to log in from specific IP address, I can manage to do at least top, like maximum three logins before I get blocked. 
So in order to bypass this uh, IP rate limit, hackers are just using many IPs, many proxies. Those are connected with a service that's called Proxy Network, and this service is actually managing the whole proxy operation for them. I dearly recommend you to learn about proxy networks and their capabilities. It's really the one most common uh, attack factor of all cyber attacks out there, specifically malicious automation. And also it serves them as it's hider true IP, uh, which is really important since uh, cracking into accounts is a criminal act in most uh, United, uh, US states. Uh, of course, uh, using a network uh, allows the whole uh, uh, outsource of the proxy uh, uh, operation, which means the hacker doesn't need to go with the proxy list and then check which one of the IPs got banned, which one is, is really uh, not working well, and then replace it. He, he saves this time while connecting through API of a specific uh, server to a proxy network that does everything. Even rotate the, uh, uh, the uh, request itself when captcha, CAPTCHA pops up. So here we can see everything comes up together to the same kind of uh, uh, cycle. Uh, it goes from the uh, left bottom. You can see the attacker there. Uh, he will use the mail validation we talked about to the username. The password will go through a word this generation that will set a, a specific a type of password that will be customized to the specific user. From then, the request will be uh, connected through the super proxy, which is the entry point of the crop proxy network. The super proxy server will use different and thousands of load balancers to spread those accounts, those requests among different devices, real devices of real people, which will make the target site really hard to block those requests afterwards. And with uh, the successful uh, logins that he managed to do, uh, using the capture, he knows what their essence, and then he gives back to these pro prospects 10%. Prospects, prospects means the people that are uh, following him, following his activity, but didn't bought anything yet. Uh, in front of them, he has the challenge of gaining their credibility. So this is why he's acting just like a freemium business model. He gives them 10% 10, 10 of the valid access account, the ones that he managed to break into. He gives it for free. And this is how we create more and more people and more and more attention on the darknet. 90% will go over uh, different uh, digital marketplaces uh, like Selig, Sopi, uh, AT Shop, and this kind of services that are practically marketplaces that are legit but are being, being misused by hackers all the time. And the last phase, uh, with all of the accounts that he didn't manage to break into because he didn't guess the right password, he will do combo recycling. He will release it again in some kind of form uh, harvesting all the credits, all the likes, which were worth later money in the same marketplace of the same form. So it's actually uh, beneficial for him. And from this point, it will be picked up by other cracker that will go from the same phase all over again. And this is why I couldn't call a sustainable cracking. Here we did, a, a, actually in Parameter X, we did a honeypot that uh, actually demonstrated the capabilities of hacker on the under, underground forms. We faked 50 uh, credentials. We marked them on our end. We post them one time into one hacking marketplace. And we waited for the logs and uh, the, the, the request. Uh, the first uh, malicious automation, open bullet request that we've seen came after only two minutes from the moment I pressed post. Uh, overall, we had 50 reposts. It's when a hacker sees it, they say, hey, it's nice, I will repost it on other platform. So we had a, a, another 15 websites that were exposed uh, in this uh, whole operation, 50 reposts after the first 24 hours. Overall, we have 600 attackers that took part of, on this uh, party without uh, their will or knowing. And uh, this is basically how we can demonstrate and see it from both sides while using uh, simple social engineering techniques on uh, hackers there. So from uh, ATO, uh, from stealing accounts, let's talk about the bots that are using those accounts exactly afterwards in product release. And we'll take, give, I will give you a one minute uh, intro there. Because scalping is used to believe to be only a thing of PS5 or sneakers, but basically, 
it affects uh, uh, all of us in a matters that we, can, we can't even imagine. We have two groups of scalping out there. The first one would be the limited edition. Those are the classic one, the sneaker marketplace, GPUs, PS5, NFTs, tickets for concert, for flying tickets. All of them are being sold and buy all, bought all the time with using bots. But we have the second part, which is really interesting, the opportunistic scalping, which means those who rely on standard demand, but temporary low supply. We've all seen it with the COVID mask in the beginning of the pandemic, when it costs something like six uh, times more than it costs right now. Uh, we had it on, with the baby formula, which won uh, during the last year, one big uh, baby formula uh, factory was shut down because of a violation of health regulation, which caused a temporary low supply. And I've seen a lot of uh, bot operators out there in Frisco for the fact that they switched sneakers or PS5 in that moment to buying a baby formula and selling it through a Facebook marketplace. And the last thing that we're seeing right now is government services, appointments, uh, specifically a passport or visa uh, embassies around the world, a visa appointment in uh, Israel, you will have to wait at least a year because of that uh, pandemic of uh, bots right there. So let's talk about retail, the ones that uh, are buying the PS5 consoles. The first thing that they will use in order to increase their success rate will be aged accounts. Aged accounts are digital accounts that exist at least a six months and sometimes even more, sometimes it comes to a year. The more the better, the more the price will be up because their value will be higher in the perspective of the hacker. And why is that so? Because aged accounts are practically uh, have lower uh, security standards. The more, the more we go through time, the more the target site, e-commerce site know and understand their hackers and they're doing much more adjustment of security measurements. So therefore, age account has less strict uh, uh, thresholds and less strict uh, uh, regulation or, uh, under the compliance of the target site itself. And this is why they have much higher success rate. Uh, this is, by, by the way, where account takeover and bots are connected because those accounts are being bought usually from uh, account uh, uh, crackers. Uh, the next thing that will be used here is the cook group itself, which is the community of the scalpers that involves a, a, a focus on specific retail product and sometimes even specific bot. This is a basic, basically the commu online community which serves as a knowledge base. Since scalping and buying product online is really a complex uh, operation and you need a lot of knowledge and a lot of different fields, so Kukup will be the answer for that. These groups are exclusive, not open to anyone, cost a lot of money, and they will have limited amount of people inside. So in order to get access, it will take some time to most of the beginners, but this is how most of the scalpers begins. In these Kukups, they will do a group buys of bot and therefore reduce their expenses, or they will share some tricks that uh, will practically make them more successful. And the third thing that they will use is the bot itself, which is practically the most overrated part of the component because it's practically every bot has a specific model for every target site. There can be a specific bot that is really good. His model is really good for specific site, but really bad for other sites. And therefore, and also if it's good for a specific site uh, on a specific launch, it doesn't mean that in a week it will be the same situation. It can be patched easily by the detection of the antibot solution of the target site. So therefore the bot itself has different, uh, the, the prices are varies between $400 to $6,000 a month. And so again, limited amount of API keys out there, very exclusive. Uh, but top performers, we use several bots for the same reasons that I just mentioned. They will do several products, they will do several sites, and they will, therefore they will use several bots. And in order to, to keep yourself on top of that, or, uh, main, like, like just huge operation, you will have to use a bot manager. And a bot manager is practically a one-stop shop for all of the bots you are using. The most common one out there is AYCD, uh, which practically gives 12 different bot, uh, tools for uh, scalpers from creating fake uh, credit cards to generating uh, emails, addresses that you can use for fake signups. Everything they will need to use uh, is right over there. 
And we have uh, the fourth thing will be the product release monitoring service. Whenever you want to know when there's a new uh, restock of PS5, you will practically go manually and search PS5. This costs a lot of time. Uh, this is practically one of the reasons that you will lose through bot. A bot won't do it himself. He will wait for a third party service, which is basically a web crawler that goes every second to the uh, target site and check. PS5 exists, PS5 exists, PS5 exists. Whenever PS5 is exist, he will go back with the PID, the product ID, and he will tell the bot exactly where to go for. And we'll show you this in the two slides for now. But this one is the most important, one of the most important components in the architecture. As you can see on the right uh, bottom, there are two tweets of heat monitors, one of the most uh, notorious uh, uh, mo uh, product release monitors out there. You can see basically they are bragging about the fact that they spotted a product release and their competitor missed it totally. And on the total right, they are bragging about the fact that they were faster from their competitors in 1.4 seconds, which might sound like, sounds like a little, but in the world of bots, this is forever and eternity, which practically makes the whole function of a, price, of a product monitoring service it serves exactly like the gun that we see on the Olympics competitions. It tells the bot exactly when to start the uh, uh, competition again to the PS5 unit. And now we have all of this, it's really nice, but we want to use better stack than what we have on our PC. The scalper, we, the top performer scalper, scalper will put some money and we will rent a dedicated server. Dedicated server means that it's not shared with other uh, scalpers, and you don't want to be share resources when you are playing a zero-sum game. When every PS5 console that I will buy, my friend, my scalper friend won't buy, I don't want to share any, more, any resources. This is why the, the service is dedicated and not shared, and also bare metal and not VPS. They are physical, they exist, and they're located, geographically lo located, around the target side servers. So they will minimize the ping time, just like you hear about fintech companies that does that uh, in order to get closer to the stock market or uh, the, uh, uh, for any kind of uh, financial institution they need to work with. Uh, that this is exactly what scalpers are doing. They will choose specific uh, uh, geolocation that are close, physically close to the target site so they can know exactly, uh, they can be first before you. And the last thing that will be here, from the dedicated server itself, they will spread all of those uh, uh, um, requests through different proxy IPs. This time, unlike crackers, they will not use just residential PCs IPs, they will use mobile. Why mobile? Mobile has different thresholds. The amount of action you can do from a five inch screen is much higher than the amount of actions that you can do using your keyboard and mouse. As a result, every target site, every common site that you are uh, surfing with will have different threshold, different uh, uh, amount of uh, tasks that you can do per IP. They're using uh, emulation to emulate uh, the whole fingerprint of mobile and mobile IPs so they can do uh, much more, uh, more tasks much more quickly from specifically geolocated uh, peers, proxy peers that are located right there. So here is where everything comes to uh, one place. As you can see, the, our scalper here is uh, connected through remote connection. Usually it will be an RDP remote uh, protocol desk, uh, remote desktop protocol uh, uh, of Windows, but not necessarily. He will manage this whole operation, which will be on the dedicated server, not on the stack. The dedicated server will constantly communicate with the price, uh, with the uh, uh, product monitor uh, service that you will see under mesh there, the product monitor will go all the time and will return once the product is, when the product is released to the site. He will come back with a PID, which is basically a shortcut to the uh, uh, product itself, and then the bot will go directly, while you are looking for the uh, specific unit, he will go directly and will buy it before you. Also, uh, all of these requests will come up from specific uh, geos, unlike Cracker that doesn't really care about where the IP is located. Scalper has really important, high importance about where he chooses to uh, his exit points, exit proxies. 
It will usually uh, located uh, next uh, to the target site, which basically most of the time will be Ashbourne, Virginia, but not necessarily. And from there, all the successful uh, checkouts that he made it to all the PS5 units that he's supposed to get by mail, he will use a post proxy company that will use fake addresses around the United States. All of those uh, PS5 will be sent to different proxy addresses and from there it will be moved to his native uh, uh, country in which he located and which he will sell it by uh, 600, 700 bucks for one unit. So where are we heading? Uh, I'm not a prophet, uh, I'm not uh, pretend to be one, but I know that there are several actors and factors that shape the whole malicious automation war that keeps on going, specifically, specifically because of Ukraine war and because of COVID. The first one thing is that we have to understand here is that the top performers, the 20% that we are talking about, are basically the early adopters of new cracking uh, tools and techniques, which means that whatever they are using will be what everybody will use in a year. Open Bullet, when it came out in May 2019, it was a niche at the beginning. Only few hackers knew how to really develop a good config. Nowadays, it's a standard. It's rarely that you can, you can rarely find a config developer, a developer that writes ATO scripts, that knows how to write it in anything else than Lolly script, the language of Open Bullet. So it's really important for us to understand those 20% and not just focus on the average uh, attacker because as I said about the hacking distribution, it's 2080 low. There's no average hackers. It's either you are in the beginners or, in, or you will stay there in the beginners or the mid range or you will go to be a top performer very, very quickly if you have the right persistency and creativity and courage. And the second thing is that every retail supply chain bottleneck is a business opportunity for both operators. Which means that right now, they like, just like the same kind of uh, attack architecture and scalping architecture that we've seen on sneakers, turn around again against PS5 and Xbox, it's the same thing that we we'll keep on seeing on other products. And I mentioned earlier the baby formula, that was just an example, but we have many other cases going on. Whatever you hear on the media about a supply chain coming up, first thing, think about the bots. Because they will come afterwards because they will see that the temporary low supply can drive them a lot of uh, profit uh, when reselling it. In fact, if uh, a retail bot had any physical existence in this uh, conference, we would practically take over all the water supply and sell you and resell you every glass of water for 70 bucks. So, what differentiates the top performers from other threat actors? <coughs> the first thing is that they will think development operation. Just like a startup, they will think about minimizing the ping time, they will think about customizing their architecture around the architecture of the uh, target site, they will think about uh, reducing the architecture resources and increasing its efficiency. They want, uh, like, let's just say, that, for example, a noob a sculptor uh, that tried to get a PS5 will care about the most about his bot. He will think that the bot is the key success uh, for that. But a top performer will focus and do uh, OSINT work and figure out where is the target site servers are located, and he will build his all architecture around it. He will use the same ISPs as the target site, so he will minimize, again, a little bit, few, every millisecond matters in that aspect, and he will think differently. And this is exactly one main differentiator that we have there. The second one, and really important one, is they all use, uh, use OSINT. Either it's the cracker that we've seen uh, earlier that established a big data set that includes all of us, uh, all, all of our PII that can be found on social media or either it's the, the uh, bot uh, operator that use, price, uh, that, re that use product release monitor in order to figure out exactly when the launch is happening. They're all making a preparation. They know exactly where everything is located. And this mindset, mindset exactly with validating the breach email and using a UX exploitation, all of this will practically make them in a different type of level. 
The third thing here, and this is the, practically the most important one as I see it from my last uh, five years of research. Um, the scalper or hacker at, at all, biggest asset is not his money, but his time. Most of the people think uh, the hackers who, uh, goes through a phase that is really similar to normal people, uh, where it's called the, production, uh, the promotion paradox. The, production, uh, the promotion paradox simply claims that every time you get a promotion, you get to, to do less and less the thing that got you the promotion from the first place. Which means, for a hacker perspective, a lot of hackers are out there thinking, yeah, I can write a code really well, I know how to hack, I'm going to do tons of money out there. And then they open up their own business and they begin to be client-facing, which is something that they never did before. All of a the sudden, they need to do marketing in order to gain some credibility in really full of fraud market. And uh, they try to sell in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. They try to un uh, uh, understand, uh, to explain to people their value. Uh, later on, they will do, uh, uh, of course, customer support and they will handle uh, tickets of clients which is something they, I believe, never thought it will happen. Here you can see, in the right there in the middle of the left, a real message of an 18-year-old hacker that did try to do an antibot bypass solution. And this guy, during exam period, actually mentioned that he won't be available since he has many exams. Of course, we took advantage of it and put 12 different detection logic while he had his exam period. <laughs> And of course, so time is also something that is really necessary. A lot of security companies are thinking about, yeah, I should make the uh, attack more expensive, so they, went to, they will go on the other side. But what's driven uh, 13 out of the 13 uh, hackers that I've tracked in the last year and a half wasn't their budget. It was their time and the fact that they needed to remain on top of the thing and to keep handling all the time with uh, uh, stuff like that. So the top performers are doing a smart thing that we all need to do in our personal life. First, they outsource uh, the code when needed. Whenever they can, whatever they can, they will outsource our side, so they will keep themselves the, the biggest asset in their time. But they will keep under their control the stuff that they will have to do, the debugging, the reverse engineering of the payload. They will learn about obfuscation techniques. They will learn about deobfuscation. They will be there uh, in order to maintain their operation working and to handle problems, but all the rest of the operation like proxies, like world lists, like uh, even credentials, they will use credential API in order to uh, minimize their time. So all of it will be outsourced the, so they will have the maximum efficiency since hackers are most of the time, in this aspect at least, works alone. So basically what I want you to, go to uh, leave this talk with. First, go to underground forums. If you haven't been there, open up an avatar, start learning, and be on the other side. It doesn't matter if you're pen testers, white hats, uh, amateur hackers, it doesn't matter. Every code that you want to write down, uh, somewhere, some, uh, someone built it, wrote it, made it, uh, upgraded it into the level of art, and uploaded it online. I still find pen testers that are trying to write down techniques that are being out there spread all the time. So know your enemy, know the threat actor, because as we've seen here, they are collecting intelligence about us all the time. The second thing that is really important here is think like a threat intelligence. And let's put it in a practical example, okay? Uh, let's just say a defender is watching this uh, talk right now on YouTube, and he thinks to himself, as a defender, I should probably put a two-factor authentication on my account. That's nice, but that's a defender type of kind of mindset. If you want to walk from the threat intelligence, think to yourself what nobody is doing on their password, and the answer will be putting space note. Nobody is using space notes inside of password, and any password generator that I came across, none of them had the possibility to add spaces because nobody do that. And no hacker that I've met ever came across or uh, thought about that enumeration with space notes. And the reason of that, that 
he never seen that kind of passport. So use spaces in your world until everybody else will do it and hacker will go for it too. But be there, hunt them down, know your enemy, and stay safe. Thank you very much. I will get uh, questions if anyone have here. Uh, and thank you very much.